Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To begin, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about the piece that we just saw. I'd like to uh, make a small correction to something that was said. Uh, mathematicians exchange theorems over Chardonnay, not wine. <laughs> um, now, my name is Juan Felipe Beltran, and I'm an NYU Abu student, as you heard. I'm in my junior year, and I will be talking about measuring musical rhythm similarity and the mathematics behind taste. Uh, I'm going to tell you why I'm very interested in the subject towards the end, because I find that it requires a bit of a buildup. So let's begin. If you've done music uh, before, you probably recognize the notation on top. Uh, when we're trying to look at rhythm, we have to find a way to make sure that uh, we know what we're playing. Now, we're all familiar with the one on top. It's, uh, you have eighth notes, you have quarter notes. It's readable. All the ones on the bottom are also representations of rhythm, believe it or not. If you look at the one in the middle that looks like uh, uh, two lines going up and down, that's actually saying I can't read that but I know that it says that. <laughs> now, when we're trying to analyze rhythm, one of the most important things we need to do is find out what representation we're going to use. My personal favorite is this one. Uh, this is a binary cyclic set. Uh, it's a notation that we first found in uh, ancient Persia. Um, basically, how it works is it's binary, meaning you either have a hit or you don't have a hit. And it's cyclic, meaning that it's a circle. So if we look in between the little black dots, you can see the little uh, white uh, circles with lines going to, towards the middle. Basically, if there's a white circle, you clap. If there's not a white circle, you don't clap. This one in particular goes, oh, here's the rumba. Now, in order for you to really understand rhythm, I, I feel like I really need to get you in the mood for rhythm. So I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to make it very easy, and this is going to be black dots and white dots. Basically, black dot, you have a clap. White dot, you don't have a clap. Before I begin making you run these, uh, I'd like to run a short drill. Please make sure you have nothing in your hands. <laughs> and just make sure you clap. It's, the microphone's here. It needs to arrive. Oh, you're too kind. You're too kind. Uh, anyways, I'm going to press a button. And when I press it, uh, that little triangle is going to start spinning. And I would really love it if you would clap whenever it reaches any of the black dots. Uh, do not fear if you're not a musical person. That's part of the experiment. Three, two, one. Very good. That's a bossa nova. And that one's uh, very famous in Brazilian music. We see it a lot in jazz nowadays. Uh, now we're going to complicate it up a bit. We're going to go with the uh, son. This one has traveled all around the world. It goes uh, Persia, Africa, Cuba, New Orleans, New York. So you'll find it in every kind of music. And we're going to try it on three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Very good. And now for the last one, we're going to complicate it a bit more, the rumba, which in Spanish literally means to party. <laughs> uh, it's pretty much the same as the claveson, except it's going to screw up everyone who hasn't done music before. <laughs> so this one should be fun. One, two, three, and go. <laughs> so those scattered claps towards uh, that bottom one, that's why I'm going to be talking about rhythm today. <laughs> now, when we show these rhythms to people, uh, you can see a lot of similarities already. They all have five hits. They're all spread across 16 spaces. Uh, when we're trying to compare it, we ask people, pretty much we sit them down, and we play them two rhythms, and we give them a slider, and we say, how related are these two? Just relative. The slider doesn't, doesn't have to mean anything. And uh, the data that we got was from some people at Harvard. So it's got uh, mixed demographics. It's got people that are really trained in music, people who are not. So kind of like the scattering in this room. Um, and what we found out was that uh, we can put the data, the distances in between rhythms, into a phylogenetic tree. Now, if you've done bio ever in high school, middle school, <laughs> elementary school, or just had books, you've seen a phylogenetic tree. Uh, usually, we use phylogenetic trees to show relationships. Uh, we take it an extra step, and we use phylogenetic trees to show relationships and distance. So here, this little spider of a graph is um, the distances in between different genres based on 16 different features. Basically, we take different genres of music, we choose some songs that we think represents, represent those genres, and we turn it into a, this sounds really cool, 16-dimensional vector. And then uh, we measure the distance in between these vectors. Uh, we're trying to do this to optimize machine learning, trying to teach a machine to hear, hear a piece of music or get information about a piece of music and tell you whether it's a Western rhythm or a non-Western rhythm. This tree turned out really neat because, as you can see, 
all the non-Western rhythms are towards this side, all the Western rhythms are towards the other. And you can see similarities between the genres that are paired up. Now, oddly enough, this is much easier to do when you have a lot of data. When we're trying to compare these, we don't have a lot of data. In fact, we have no idea what to compare. So like every good scientist does, uh, we tried to apply about five different things to this, and four of them failed. Uh, but the fifth one was quite neat. Turns out, if you take the distances in between the, the, the strikes, and I don't mean just the distances at, of adjacent strikes, but throughout the whole circle, uh, you can start looking at some relationships. Over here, you can see that it takes three beats to get from this one to this one, from this one to this one, from this one to this one, and from this one to this one. So it means that there's four uh, instances of distance three. So we build these histograms for every single one of the rhythms. Uh, once we have the histograms, now the challenge is comparing them. Again, we tried different things, and half of them failed. But the one that worked was not this one. Turns out if you try to overlap them, you get nothing out of it. The tree looks completely senseless. So we're just going to wipe that. Uh, what we're going to do is my favorite measurement in the world, the Mallow's distance. It's also called the Earth Mover's distance. Basically, what we want to do is we want to see how many movements it takes to turn one histogram into the other. So if we're comparing Son and Rumba, it takes one movement, two movements. If we're looking at something more complicated, let's say comparing Son to a translated version of the Bossa Nova histogram, it takes us a bunch of moves. In this case, we have 10 moves in order to get to rhythm x. Once we take these distances, we can plot them, and we actually got the following diagram. Uh, this shows you uh, the distance uh, using Mallow's distance in between these rhythms. Weirdly enough, it turns out that this is almost exactly the same as the human perception of how these rhythms are related. Uh, overall, we were able to separate what rhythms are rela uh, how related rhythms are for humans how we organize genres in our head. And right now we're working on a paper to be published uh, later this year on a magic number that tells you whether a rhythm is very liked by humankind or very not liked by humankind. Sadly, I cannot tell anyone or I'd have to kill you all. And <laughs> there's cameras. It gets very complicated. <laughs> so um, when we get these results, we all pat each, other, p pat each other in the back and we congratulate ourselves. But we have the big question, why? Is our brain doing this? I have not once heard someone tell me, I think that the rumba and the claveson sound very similar because they just sound like they have really similar histograms. That's a sentence I don't think anyone has ever said. Uh, so we can't ask people. They don't know what's going on inside their head. So we take the scientific approach and we cut their head open. Um, now, allow me, allow me to oversimplify brain research for you. Uh, Michael Gazzaniga was the father of split brain research. Basically, as a treatment for epilepsy, you, severed, uh, you need to cut the corpus callosum and you separate the two halves of the brain. They can still communicate in some ways, but there's now a uh, distinction between them. Basically, right, hand of the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, left side of the brain, right side of the body. It so happens to be that the speech center is on the left side of the brain, which leads to some interesting effects. The key ring experiment, you set a person with a split brain in front of a screen, and you show the word key on one side and the word ring on the other side. You ask them, what word do you see? They will say ring. You ask them, do you see any other word? No. You give their left hand uh, uh, objects to pick from amongst, and they will pick up a key. Creepy. Let's take the creepiness one step further. Uh, one thing Gatsaniga did was he decided to uh, show people the word bell and the word music. In this instance, the conscious part of the brain is looking at the word music. If you ask a person, what are you looking at? They will say, music. Gazzaniga gave them the following test, the patient the following test. Which one of these four best represents the, the word that you just saw? We have a pair of drummers, a man playing the trumpet, a church, and a jukebox. I wouldn't be presenting this if the findings weren't interesting. Uh, so you all know now that he picked the church. That's not the really scary part, though. The scary part is that when they asked him, why did you pick the church? He immediately said, well, I've been listening to a lot of bell music lately, and so it's just fresh in my mind. I'll give you a second to absorb that. Our brain is fantastic at keeping our status quo nice and clean. Whatever our brain believes, our brain wants to continue believing. So when our brain comes across a decision that it can't justify, it's really good at making up an excuse on the spot. Uh, as a debater, I've learned to harness this skill. <laughs> um, but it is not always moral. Now, this brings, this brings something very odd into question, which is when we combine 
the fact that we can rationalize on the spot with the fact that we're getting closer and closer to defining uh, music in terms of mathematics. When we look at a painting, when we look at, uh, when we hear a piece of music, when we think about what we like and why we like it, when we look at how things are related, we always have our own justifications. But one thing that we tend to ignore is the fact that just because we can rationalize something doesn't mean that that is the reason that we're doing something or the reason that we are choosing something. When we look at a painting, there can be biological reasons behind why we like a painting, certain patterns, certain colors. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the fact that it looks a lot like your childhood home. Your brain is really good at giving you an excuse for why you do things. That is not to say that all taste is biological and not based on any kind of, of personal relationship. But that is to say that we need to learn to be more skeptical about how we approach uh, the end of the road in terms of rationalization. Usually, the second we reach an answer, we decide that that's good enough, and we let it be. Um, and now comes the part that I was building up to. Uh, why am I interested both in music and this concept of rationalization? Well, it all happened after a very, very, very happy moment in my life. Um, I know, I'm sorry, I don't have a beard, it's just... Ugh. <laughs> Basically, um, my jaw was a bit too small for my skull, so I couldn't breathe well for a long time. Uh, after my surgery, there was a combination of things happening to my body. I had a lot of oxygen, I had some shock, antibodies were, uh, the antibiotics were doing really fun stuff to my head. And so there were two main effects that I observed. First, um, I hallucinated a lot, uh, and the hallucinations were mo mostly auditory. Uh, it was quite fun, I kept hearing people calling me, and at one point in the hospital, I was um, condemned, I'd like to say, to an hour of I'm the devil, I love metal, on replay in my head. <laughs> Wondering, why is this happening to me? And then, why is this happening? Uh, <laughs> led me to want to learn more about music and the brain. The other effect was that I was very, very, very bored. This is not the face of a person that can hold a conversation. This is not the face of a person who can watch a TV show. I literally just lied in bed for about like a week and a half, looking at the particular point in the wall, thinking. And here's a problem with thinking, when you can't get out of your own head. You realize that, pardon my French, you're really full of shit. Um, I tried to think about the reasons why I do everything. I tried to think about the rationalizations behind why I treat people the way I treat them, why I like the things I like. And I realized that I wasn't being ske skeptical with myself at all. Uh, I've learned to treasure introspection, especially after being forced into a cage match with myself. Um, and the key to introspection is being able to keep on looking past the first answer. Just because you are able to rationalize something, just because you think you have a reason, doesn't mean that that's why you're doing anything. We've seen in our previous talks, uh, this theme has uh, come up. When you're angry, you want to be right. You just, you, you scream at people and your arguments make fantastic sense. It doesn't mean that that's why you're angry. In the same way, when you're trying to identify yourself and try to find how you fit in the community that you're in, it's really easy to stop at, uh, at any one trouble. It's easy to like, find one reason why you feel ostracized. That doesn't mean that that is the only reason. You always need to keep on exploring. If you are interested in further study of uh, weird things your brain can do with music and how uh, music is interesting to us, I would actually suggest these two books. Oliver Sacks has a fantastic TED Talk. Please watch it. Um, and Daniel Levitin has a fantastic book, This Is Your Brain on Music. Um, as far as how I arrived at this field, I just have to thank Nwayu Budabi, Fate, and Gottfried Toussaint, who's a genius at computer science and taught me everything I know about rhythm. Also, there's Xia uh, Hua Liu and Nishant who helped me with this research. Um, basically, if I have one takeaway uh, for you today, is that just because you can think of something, just because you can rationalize it, just because it sounds right, doesn't mean it is right, including this talk. <laughs> thank you.